The extinction is the process of generating an organism that resembles or is an extinct species, and in recent years significant progress has been made in the field. Some experts claim that we are only a matter of years away from resurrecting extinct animals, but not everyone is thrilled with this news. De extinction is very controversial, and some believe that long extinct animals should remain in the past. It's criticised by many as some people believe that it's scientists trying to play the role of God, and the world is a very different place compared to when the extinct animals roam the earth. Some cloned animals have also had very short lives with lots of health problems, so some argue that it's not ethical as the created animals will suffer. Others believe that if we were the reason why the animals went extinct, then we should be able to bring them back and right our wrongs. The technology being used to bring back extinct animals is also being used to try and save endangered animals, and I think most people will agree that this is the right thing to do. Even though we hear about de-extinction a lot in the news, only one animal has been successfully brought back from extinction. The Pyrenean ibex was a subspecies of the Iberian ibex, and it was declared extinct in the year 2000. Following several failed attempts to revive the subspecies through cloning, a living specimen was born in July 2003, but this ibex didn't last very long at all. She died several minutes after she was born due to a lung defect, and this meant that the Pyrenean ibex is the only animal to have gone extinct twice. Since the early 2000s, a lot of progress has been made, and some believe that it's possible that we could be bringing back a few extinct animals in the next 10 years. In today's video, I'll be going through just a few of these animals, and we'll start off with a very famous bird. The dodo was endemic to the island of Mauritius, but it disappeared in the late 1600s. It was quite a hefty bird standing around 75 centimetres in height and weighing around 17 to 21 kilograms. They were able to get this large as they had no natural predators on the island, and this is why it's common to find large flightless birds on island ecosystems around the world. The dodo is one of the most mysterious and captivating recently extinct animals, as humans once laid their eyes on them and recorded their image and behaviours, and there are no other birds like them alive today. Like with many of the other famous extinctions, there was more than one reason behind its disappearance, but most of the reasons were human-related. Mauritius was visited by Arab vessels in the Middle Ages and by Portuguese ships in the early 1500s, but none of these explorers decided to settle here. The Dutch Empire acquired Mauritius in 1598, and this would soon lead to the end for the dodos. Soon after this, the dodos were hunted by the settlers along with many of the other native animals, and this can be seen in a 1648 engraving. This destruction and relentless hunting of native wildlife was prevalent at the time, and the dodo wasn't the only native bird to go extinct. The hunting of the dodos wasn't the only reason behind their decline, as they were also affected by habitat loss as the Dutch sailors would use the trees on the island to build their ships, and they were affected by the animals that the Dutch introduced onto the island. Dogs, pigs, cats, rats and crab-eating macaques were introduced and competed with the dodos, and these animals would also plunder their nests. This wasn't helped by the fact that the dodos only laid one egg at a time, so it was extremely difficult for the dodos to bounce back and adapt. The dodo story makes them sound like a hopeless, defenseless bird, but this was far from the truth. One of their main problems was that they were fearless due to having no natural predators, but if they felt threatened, they could fight back. A 1631 Dutch letter that described a lot of their behaviour and demeanour said, Their war weapon was the mouth, with which they could bite fiercely. Their beak is arguably their most iconic feature, and it's no surprise that they could inflict some serious damage with it. After the dodo was discovered, it was found to be interesting enough that specimens were sent to Europe and the East, and they were featured in many beautiful artworks of the time. It's believed that the dodos could have already been rare before the arrival of humans, but we definitely finished them off very quickly. This is just one example of how destructive we humans can be, but today scientists are working to bring dodos back. Even though these weird and wonderful birds went extinct hundreds of years ago, we still have some pretty intact remains and samples today. This could be enough material needed to bring them back, and one day we could see them in the wild once again.
Colossal Biosciences, in partnership with the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation, are working to bring back and reintroduce the dodo. And if you believe what's being reported, then we could see progress relatively soon. The full genome of the dodo has been sequenced, and so has the genome of the solitaire, an extinct relative of the dodo, and the Nicobar pigeon, which is the dodo's closest living relative. Geneticists at Colossal have found cells that act as a precursor for ovaries or testes in the Nicobar pigeon, can grow successfully in a chicken embryo, and they are now testing if these cells can turn into sperm and eggs. This is a vital step in creating hybridized animals through reproduction, and by using this method, scientists have already created a chicken that was fathered by a duck. Colossal Biosciences are planning to use this technology to bring back the dodo by editing the primordial germ cells of the Nicobar pigeon, so it expresses the physical traits of a dodo. The edited primordial germ cells will then be inserted into the embryos of a sterile chicken and rooster, and in theory their offspring will resemble the dodo because of their hybridized pigeon DNA in their reproductive systems. It's unclear how long this process will take, but scientists are already trying to find suitable habitat to release these long dead birds. Because the dodo was one of the largest native animals on Mauritius, it likely played a very important role in the ecosystem, and many of the native plants and animals would have benefited from having it around. This is one of the main arguments behind their de-extinction and reintroduction, and it would be great to see them roam this earth once again. The dodo could run into the same problems that caused its downfall the first time around. And of course, Mauritius is a very different place than it was 400 years ago. Thankfully, there are a few islands in Mauritius that remain mostly wild and free of invasive species, and it's possible that they would be able to survive here. This could possibly mean that the reintroduction of the dodo could benefit the Mauritian ecosystem. But to find out for sure, we'll just have to wait and see. The thylacine is one of the most tragic and quite frankly depressing recent extinctions, as it was completely preventable and there are no other animals like it today. The thylacine was the largest carnivorous marsupial of its time, and before the arrival of Europeans in Australia, it was found on the Australian mainland and Tasmania. They may appear to resemble foxes and dogs, but their closest living relatives are animals such as Tasmanian devils, quolls, and numbats. They had a few distinctive features that set them apart from similarly looking creatures, such as striking stripes on their backs, and a mouth that they could open very wide. For most of its reign, the thylacine was an apex predator, but the size of the prey that it fed on is disputed. Some believe that it could have fed on prey as large as emus, but it's likely that their most common prey items were smaller animals such as swamp hens, wallabies, and rakali. Prior to the arrival of the Europeans in Australia, they were already thought to be rare, but the Europeans wiped them out in no time at all. Once again, there are many factors that led to this animal's demise, but it's possible that they could still be here today if the Europeans hadn't arrived in Australia. Dingoes definitely played a role in the downfall of this species, because even though most people believed them to be a totally Australian animal, they were introduced into Australia by humans around 4,000 years ago. The dingoes would have competed with the thylacine, and as the thylacine was a hypercarnivore, it was less versatile than the omnivorous dingo. What humans did to the thylacine was far worse, as they were relentlessly hunted throughout their range. At one point in time, there was even a bounty placed on the thylacine in Tasmania, with 2,184 bounties being paid out. This was almost half of their estimated population at the time, and the main reason behind this bounty system was the fear of damages to livestock. This reasoning is still very controversial to this day, as some of the pictures of the thylacine feeding on livestock is thought to be doctored and the claims of them attacking livestock are thought to be extremely exaggerated. Their reputation as livestock killers was enough to bring about their end, but at least we still have footage and a few images of them today. Because they are such a missed and immensely loved species, many people want to see them in the wild once again, and this has opened the door to people looking for attention and a quick buck. I'm not saying that it's completely impossible that the thylacine is still out there somewhere in the wilderness, but the amount of people claiming to have seen it in Australia is quite tedious. Some people fake sightings or just make up stories about finding them, and this seems to be quite a lucrative gig. 
Thankfully, there are some scientists actively working to bring these animals back, and they have quite a lot of material to work with. Only a few weeks ago, it was claimed that a major breakthrough was made in the attempt to bring back the thylacine, as experts claimed that they had been able to extract a thylacine DNA sequence that is 99.9% .9 the same as the original. They were even able to extract more fragile RNA molecules from the sample, and this allowed the experts to see which of the thylacine's genes were being expressed in certain tissues. Colossal Biosciences are once again behind this project, and by editing the genes of the closely related fat-tailed Dunnart, they aim to create a creature that's as close to the thylacine as possible. It's still unclear how close the team is to actually creating a new thylacine-like creature, but if they were to pull it off, it would be one of the biggest science success stories for decades. The woolly mammoth is one of the most well-known giants of its era, and it still intrigues many of us around the globe. Even though it's the most famous mammoth, it was not the only species, and it was one of the last mammoths to disappear. The last of the woolly mammoths were found on an island off the coast of Russia, until they were eventually wiped out around 4,000 years ago. They were around the same size as modern-day African elephants, and thanks to well-preserved specimens frozen in permafrost, we know quite a lot about what they looked like and how they lived. I went over this briefly in an old video about animals that have been found in permafrost, but some of the specimens were so well-preserved that they even had soft tissues and fur. We'll never know for certain what caused the extinction of the woolly mammoth, but like with other extinct animals, it was likely due to a number of complicated factors. Most experts agree that it was a combination of climate change and disease, and it's likely that we humans also hunted them in large numbers. Because these giants were so iconic, it's understandable why people want to bring them back, but today's world is very different to what it was 4,000 years ago. The mammoth steppe ecosystem in which they thrived is mostly gone, but some argue that if these giants were actually brought back from the dead, they could help to tackle climate change and bring back the mammoth steppe ecosystem. Pleistocene rewilding is the advocacy for the reintroduction of extant Pleistocene megafauna or their closest modern-day relatives, as it's believed that this will help to restore functioning, self-sustaining ecosystems. This type of rewilding is already taking place in Pleistocene Park, which is located in one of the last woolly mammoth strongholds. The aim of the park is to bring back the mammoth steppe ecosystem, and therefore stop the thawing of the permafrost and slow down global warming. There are many arguments both for and against bringing back woolly mammoths, but how close are we to actually bringing them back? Colossal Biosciences have once again spearheaded this woolly mammoth project, and have claimed that we could see mammoth-like creatures as early as 2028. The team have come close to sequencing complete woolly mammoth genomes, but other parts of the process are still very challenging. Colossal Biosciences aim to implant a hybrid elephant-mammoth embryo into an Asian or African elephant, and create a woolly mammoth-like creature. It would be amazing for any of us to see such an amazing creature in our lifetimes, but as this is still relatively new science, it still remains hard to believe. If we were able to bring back woolly mammoths and in turn stop the thawing of the permafrost, it would open the door to other rewilding projects, but for now all we can do is wait. If there are any other de-extinction projects that you believe I should have featured in this video, then let me know down in the comments below. But that's it for now, and until next time, goodbye.